Welcome back, folks, to What's Next Beyond Service. Today is our final episode for season one. It's episode number 42, and it's entitled Purple. Purple is the color of courage. And we're going to talk to that here uh, in the interview. And I think you're going to really uh, enjoy what that means. And so with that said, our guest today is Abigail Manning. Abigail, welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm honored and delighted and um, looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, as, I as well. And as this is our last show, uh, it means a lot to have somebody like you come on because I think we're going to provide something a little different uh, in terms of what our viewers are, are used to seeing. Uh, the, the premise of the show, you know, it's, it's called What's Next Beyond Service for a reason, right? Because people spend time in the military and then at some point it's time to go whether you're retiring or whether you've made a conscious decision hey I've, I've done a few years uh i made my commitment to my country it's time to move on or maybe you get injured and you know you weren't prepared for that but you have to leave a lot of ways to leave service and this podcast is designed to talk through those those different scenarios awesome cool okay so yeah, I'm not sure exactly the the last thing uh, that you guys were able to hear, but I was just kind of walking through, you know, a standard uh, interview here uh, in the importance of transitioning and all the things that uh, people go through and then they come here and share so that folks who are making a transition have a better feel for some of the things that they uh, might not uh, know is is coming their way. So, um, Abigail, can you uh, can you just hear everything good? Yes, I can. And I, I definitely didn't hear everything from before. So just feel free to circle back on it. Um, okay. and my, you know, it, it's all about service and I come from a different fo form of service. Um, I am a civilian and I always want to make sure that that's really clear. I honor and respect yes. everybody who's taken that oath. That is huge to me as a mom of Marines. Um, and my father was in the military, like that's huge, huge, huge. I'm honored to speak and work with military and veteran nonprofits, but I always want to say that um, this is how I serve. I serve those who took the oath. I serve those who said, um, I'm willing to give the ultimate um, paycheck. And um, it's really hard when you're watching your beloved children say that. So I admire yes. everyone who is willing to do it. If it's, you know, four years, if it's a full career, um, I, you know, you have my ultimate respect, and if I can be of value in any way, let me know. Um, but I'm really and, excited. I'm, I've definitely got yeah. that protector um, heart, and uh, I've always had the protector heart. So I think that's some of the reason too why I connect well with the military and veterans. Yes, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I just, you know, for the time that uh, we've had together in conversation. And then, of course, seeing some of the uh, interviews that, or excuse me, the uh, uh, speaking engagements that you have posted on on YouTube and other uh, platforms, uh, which what I want to do, um, and I know Sarah will, will do this because she's good at this, when we go to post the interview onto YouTube, uh, anything that you want to share in addition to our interview today, so some of those other speaking engagements you know, uh, the the two pager that you provided, if you want to provide that as well, so that we can include that in the description part so folks can see all the good stuff you're doing and make you more available to, to folks. So, yeah. So, you know, along those lines, Abigail, and that's, you know, kind of where I was heading is our traditional show is we bring folks who have served in the military or as first responders, and we talk about the different things you go through transition wise, you know, again, just for the sake of uh, my audio being uh, messed up, uh, we, we look at people that are transitioning, there is a checklist, it's a standard thing that most folks can certainly understand. If you spend any time in the military, you, you get involved in planning. So you become proficient at planning. So that part really isn't too hard. You just have to know when to begin, and then be diligent. As the time goes forward that you're on mark that you're you know giving yourself progress checks that's all basic stuff but it's the other stuff like how will this affect me mentally you know emotionally you know a lot of folks are surprised how much they really miss the service even though they think 
yeah, hey, I'm ready to get out, you know, and then time goes by and they miss the guys and gals who were on their left and right. And the things that are sometimes don't appear as tangible maybe as they really are that you start, you know, oh, wow. Yeah. I really missed that. And some people get into doubting purpose and even doubting themselves, which is a, that could be a scary uh, road to travel. So anyhow, that, we, those are the things we normally talk about. So what's cool about having Abigail on, and, and she's just spoke to some of that here a few minutes ago is although she didn't serve, she has a, a heart of service. She's a servant leader. Uh, she has focused most of what she does professionally on folks like us, you know, people that are serving active duty, but then certainly people who are veterans. And th that there's a lot of folks out there uh, that can use and really benefit from what Abigail brings in terms of coaching and kind of getting into the, the underside of what happens here in here, you know, the balance that you need as you're taking on life and smart ways uh, to do that. And, you know, we've, we had a great call uh, on Tuesday and it, it really was. And, you know, the purpose of those calls is just to kind of get to know the other person a little better so that the interview isn't, you know, cold turkey, but then, you know, you find out more about them as well. You want to talk about, well, these are the uh, areas that we want to cover on, on an interview just so that we're on the same sheet. Um, and so often, and I'm blessed that the people that I bring onto the show all are just so, you know, they're, they're giving and they're good people and they like to talk about things that are important in life. So we had a tremendous discussion. Uh, I was driving, uh, down to San Diego and, um, you know, so we, we got to know each other, uh, and that was really cool. And so this show today, how it's going to be different is Abigail is not going to talk about her military transition. You know, she's going to share with us, you know, what she wants to share with us about her background. So that's where, where we will begin. And then from that, I want to talk about what Abigail is doing now in terms of, her, her coaching and, and the things that she brings to our community, because the things that she's doing are worth sharing. So she's going to tell us about that because she's, yeah, you know, she's talking to uh, the cadets at the Air Force Academy. She's talking to the Air Force University. She's talking to folks in the Navy at NAFAC uh, down in, I guess, San Diego area. Uh, and so, you know, this is kind of her, her base, if you will, talking to these active duty folks. She's also uh, doing uh, volunteer work with Red, White, and Blue. Uh, and I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I know there are others, but Abigail will enlighten us on that. So what I want to do, Abigail, now is uh, let's spend some time uh, talking about, about you, right? Uh, again, what you want to share with us. Um, and then let's kind of transition into the why piece of veterans and people who are serving our country. So I'm going to, I'm going to hand it off to you here. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And Sarah and I both were like, uh Oh, cause the mic went out just for a second there. And I was like, Oh no. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah somebody so I'm on my phone and somebody called in, so I had to dismiss it. So <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, good. It's all live good. and live and in color <laughs> live. <laughs> and go with the flow. Well, the first thing I want to say about transition is it is hard transition is hard. And so if you're having fears or doubts or second guesses, or as I call it, pretty bird squirrel uh, thinking, <laughs> it's totally to be expected. That is normal. It's absolutely normal to have those fears and doubts and insecurities um, and come into our life. And especially in a point of transition, even if you're excited about it. So if you think about buying a new house, you're excited, but moving in, there's a lot of stress and fear and doubt and pain and anguish you have to do and steps you, it's, you were talking about that checklist that you have to go through to move into a new house. Getting married, getting divorced, like sometimes those are equally happy. <laughs> and and <All> right. <laughs> yet there's, you know, struggle with both of them. And, and that's, so just take a step back and remember that this is transition and transition is hard. 
And it also is a time that can be really triggering for us because as I have, my work is related, I built a curriculum. Um, I think I first wanna, you want me to share a little bit about my background and why I built the curriculum? Would that be helpful? Sure, Sarah? yeah, it, it, okay. exactly. So I, I, it kind of builds a bit of a, you know, understanding okay. for the folks that will be listening to this. And, you know, those things you just talked about transition wise, uh, I mean, you're so right, because those are significant life events, right? That's what we call those things. And a transition is one of those. And as I like to, and it's repetitive, but it's for a reason, because, you know, different folks will see the show, right? Uh, not everyone's going to see the same show. But part of that transition thing is you can have multiple transitions in a short amount of time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, yeah, it's, there's a lot to process with that. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things, and I'll get to my background in just a second, like you mentioned, like, you know, a DD-214, I've seen so many of them and people are so excited to get them. And then there's almost- I'm glad you know five. what that is. That's cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around the block. I'm definitely a civilian, but I'm I am not completely in the dark. Um, and, and even the language. So that's something that I'll go, I'll jump back to my background in a little bit so that this makes sure. sense. But the language that we say inside of our heads and we also say to other people is definitely something that I hope one of the takeaways that people will have after listening. So transition, like the language separation, you know, you're being separated right from the military. Ow! Like it's not a like happy party send off. It's like you're separated, you're cut off. And I've heard this so many times, like I was a hero and then the next day I was a zero. You know, door was closed right. and locked and behind me and I was out here on my own. So I love that people started transition a year out. Um, that's really highly recommended in the different organizations that I've talked with and work with. Um, they all right. talk about year out and it's what I also encourage for people. And, and interesting, you mentioned cadets. I work, I've worked quite a bit with cadets um, down at USAFA as a guest instructor. I've been very honored. One of the things that I love is telling them transition into your future. Start your LinkedIn account now now right. while you're meeting people and then transition out of this so you're always thinking about what's ahead um and unity and optimism are the two big takeaways i try to share with people and i think if you're thinking transition what's my forward thinking where is my path the best is yet to still come and the reason why i developed those is because i grew up without those i grew up without unity i grew up without optimism um, i actually grew up with childhood abuse by both of my parents um, I went through domestic violence. I landed in the pit of PTS. And I know down in post-traumatic stress, I don't think it's a D personally, because I don't think it's a disorder. I think it's an absolutely logical, rational outcome of traumatic stress, traumatic trauma. Right. Um, and so I, I, think I, I think you're, I, sorry for interrupting, but I, I could not agree more. Absolutely. And people that go through that and experience it you know they need time to you know to heal yeah and you'll be okay you know yeah. i mean some folks you know have other issues and and that happens right that's life but the vast majority of people that have post-traumatic stress you know them <laughs> they're your neighbors they're folks you work with they're high functioning people you know and once you realize and go through and understand what it all means you know, you can get through it. And that's one of the great things about what you're doing uh, is, is so instructive and people need to hear this. Uh, and people in the military are transitioning absolutely need to hear this. <laughs> oh, good, good. Well, and I'm an open forum, so we can guide the yeah. conversation anywhere that we want. Um, when I said about language, language is really important to me. And so if we can remove any of the angst any of the shame, blame, judgment, and isolation that language creates, right? So I'm a strong person. I've always been a strong person. Protectors, providers, servant heart, strong people, strong people, right? And we're not about to raise our hands and say, I have a disorder. Right. Like, I take care of other people. I don't need to be taken care of. Get behind me. I will protect you is what we're the cloth that we're caught from. So for to ask us to say, do you have a disorder? You have a problem. You are the problem. Any of those types of things, no one's going to raise their hand. And psychologically, and I'm not a therapist. I'm not anything like that. I do have a double major and it includes cognitive, social, and behavioral sciences. Um, but what I teach is what I learned in the life trenches. And mine is right. take away those obstacles and those hurdles. And you say, well, of course you're down in the pit. 
of course you're human you have feelings you have emotion it's normal it's okay you take out the language of i need help to i would like support i want assistance how would you get out of this right we can take the, all the language out of it and the more clean we make it the more factual it's post-traumatic stress then it removes the hurdles at least for me for saying yes identifying and seeing myself with pts right because i didn't even think right. i had there's no way i don't have it sure um, right I'm absolutely just, you know, just not eating. I'm just jumping at everything. I'm just crying at everything. I don't trust anybody. I'm not going to leave the house. Like, and then people are like, that doesn't seem like you. I'm like, yeah, no, actually it doesn't, does it? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and you know, Abigail, it's, it's so counter culture too, to, to folks in the military, you know, for the things you just spoke to, because, you know, when you're the person that folks are looking to, you have to be this, you know, impervious shield uh, to where things don't, impact you. Uh, uh, John McCaskill was on the last show, and, and he talked a little bit about that uh, in terms of mindfulness, how, you know, all the things that are stressors, he's like, they're saying, uh, hey, well, you're a mindfulness guy, so that stuff doesn't affect you. He's like, you know, no, it does. <laughs> it absolutely does. But I have tools to handle those things. And I know that's, you know, part of what you're going to be talking about. But I think that's so cool that, that is becoming more mainstream. Mm -hmm. And I think it is in the military too. And, and, and it's a good thing. I mean, I think you have to be stoic to be in the military, but it doesn't mean that you can't be smart about how you deal with yourself. And, you know, once you start re realizing these things uh, that are happening, that you do get support, right? That you do go to the folks that can, you know, assist with whatever those things may be, instead of just putting it off and putting it off. And then you have generations of people who served that are suffering in silence. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, people that served during the Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, people didn't talk about the stuff that we talk openly about now. And they suffered and they, you know, I, I remember, and I'm kind of going on a sidetrack real quick, but it, I think this is important to what we're I'm talking about i remember years ago seeing a documentary on marines that were uh, in the south pacific and they had an opportunity to go back to some of the islands where they you know had these terrible battles and they're there together and they're talking and one of them started talking about post-traumatic stress and this you know this of course these gentlemen were you know they're in their eight at the time they were probably late 80s early 90s and one of them this you know, he started crying and he said, you know, all these years, I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. Yeah. I thought I was crazy, but thank God people are talking about these things. And now I understand the, you know, what this is and my God, I wish I would have, you know, I wish we would have been better at this. We, people call us the, the greatest generation and that's very humbling, he says, but we didn't get this right. Uh, and so that's very encouraging when you hear a, a warrior that, you know, lived that life and then has been suffering all these years because uh, he was ashamed and didn't understand, you know, what was happening and, and how best to approach it. So, yeah, you know, thank goodness there are people and again, people like you that are helping to shine light on issues like this so that folks do feel good about making themselves whole again, right? Because you have to, you have to buy into it. It just doesn't happen. So. Yeah. Yeah, I love that you bring up, well, first and foremost, when we get to life skills, I will, I can circle back to John. John is amazing. <laughs> he is. Absolutely delighted to know him as a colleague and professionally. And I'm beyond delighted to be able to call him a friend. Um, he doesn't live that far from me. He's attended a Team RWB event. Um, and I was on his podcast when he was still active duty SEAL commander. And we talked about purple threads and he yes. came forward and shared like on air the first time he's like, I don't know if I've ever shared this. That's the power of authentic connection with other people. When you find a safe, trusting person before the show started, we talked about grace and space and allowing right. that atmosphere to happen between people. And a lot of that is sincerity, authenticity. It's taking away any judgment language, like, Scott, you feel crazy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you're not going to come back. You know, you're not going to come back and talk to me. I'll be like, well, of course, Scott, you feel that way. Of course you do. You've been to combat. And 
um, taking the judgment out of it and we create more unity with one another. And when you can share commonalities and you can say, hey, my story is different. So I raised my kids from age five and two by myself. I was sole provider, sole disciplinarian. I wore the dad hat, I wore the mom hat, I wore the financial hat, all of that, right? And then people say, oh, well, I didn't do that, but I could see this. And then people can see themselves in each other and right. strength and say, if she can do it, I can do it. If he could do it, I can do it, right? And I know that I've had people who get very upset with me about it is post-traumatic disorder, like do not diminish it. And I said, you know what? If the language means that much to you, use it. That's great, because that's the fighting spirit we need. <laughs> And right. some people like to say post-traumatic growth. That's great. I absolutely grew from mine. And that's what my, my story is about. To thrive is a choice. It takes a lot of hard work to thrive. It takes a yes. lot of effort to thrive. It takes a lot of, as you said, purple. Pur so purple is the color of courage. And that's what it really is. It takes a lot of courage to look within and say, I don't want to be here. I don't want to stuck here. And I am not crazy. I deserve resources. I'm going to go and get them. It doesn't mean I'm weak. It means I'm strong because I'm willing to do the hard work. I'm willing to climb out of here when they throw the rope down. I'm willing right. to look myself squarely in the face and the things and the traumas I've been through. So that gentleman who cried at age 80, I would love for us to cry now, get it done, get the tools we need, and then be able to move forward and thrive and show other people how to do it. And I know when people say growth, I think if someone told me when I was in the pit and I was shaking and scared and not able to eat that, you know, you're going to grow from this. You're going to be so thankful. Like, <laughs> like yeah, you're not there yet. <laughs> you're not there yeah. yet. And then you feel even more awful. Like, why am I not growing? Why am I not grateful for the opportunity that I've been through a situation that I'm lucky to be alive? Like, yeah, it makes you feel guilty, far. right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, something that you just said about, um, Throwing throwing a rope down, you know, down into that pit of despair, and this is, you know, we're having an open conversation. That's what I like about this. You know, it's uh, kind of like having coffee with a with a friend. Uh, my best friend uh, is a guy that I I, I go, yeah, that's a, a Colorado. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> Actually, I, I got my Colorado. I should, you know what? I'm a knucklehead. I, I should have had my Colorado Springs coffee mug. Wasn't thinking about it, but uh, it's okay. a beautiful green color. It's uh, really nice. But am I a friend of mine? Uh, we've known each other since you know, like seventh grade. Uh, so we grew up together, and we've remained close friends. Our kids grew up together for the most part. You know, I'm Uncle Scott. He's Uncle Mark. You know, uh, so anyhow, um, and I'm sure he now he probably wouldn't mind me talking about this. Now, I won't go into a lot of detail, personal detail on him specifically, but. Uh, he's changed over the years. We all do. Right. He was always a very tough guy, very smart guy, but a real tough guy. He, he wouldn't share much on what's going on in here. He would tell you about all kinds of other stuff. Right. Um, years go by and this is probably about, it's been about five years, I guess. He calls me and says, Hey, I've got prostate cancer. And I'm kind of scared. Uh, you know, his dad had it. And so he was kind of, you know, oh, well, he, he was absolutely aware of it. But and so he was kind of on top of it, you know, by going often. And so, okay, hey, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. The doctors, we're going to treat him. And I noticed the times that I was with him. Who is this guy? This is not Mark. He was at a lower level. He just seemed like his mind was somewhere else. He wasn't engaging. He just, and so he was here at the house and he goes, hey, can we go for a walk? Sure. So we went through a walk to the vineyards and it's beautiful. And he, he sorry, <laughs> he looks at me and he starts to cry. And I'm like, I've never seen this man cry. And that was, that was, I mean, it wasn't strange. It was just very, a very powerful moment. And, you know, he was, he was afraid, you know, he's like, I don't know what's going to happen. And he goes, you know, I, I don't want to die. And I was like, well, you know, Mark, every, everything that you're telling me, it seems like things are good. You know, you have to have faith 
that what your doctor's telling you, you know, you've stayed true to yourself with, you know, diet, with exercise. And if I was to throw you a rope into where you're feeling now and help pull you up, would you take that rope? Mm. And he looked at me and goes, yes, yeah, a- absolutely. And that got him to think a little differently about that. And that's, that's kind of a long story to get back to what you said. But I think that's so important when you talk to somebody that's in that state that you're offering, that there's a way out. And, you know, and without going into the rest of it, uh, it's kind of set the stage for allowing him to see that differently and that it's okay to feel this way. And what you did today, you were asking for help. You know, and he wasn't that kind of guy. He never, he never asked for help because he, he's very capable. So even these toughest people, you know, uh, once they realize that, hey, I, it's okay to, to ask for somebody to come in and do these things because we can't always do everything ourselves. Sometimes we need uh, assistance. So, yeah, I anyhow, love that. Yeah. I love that. And, and and what you remind me about your story about Mark is that we're strong on the outside, right? And some, some, most of us are like physically strong, but we've got that kind of like attitude. Like, you know, my daughter, when someone's coming up and they mean trouble, like you've never seen someone look so strong. There's like a force field that comes out of her through her eyes, and through her body language and everything. Talk about strength, man. Like she's amazing. And, uh, and yet we need to be strong on the inside. And strong on the inside does not mean I'm impervious to thought, like to feelings and emotions. I don't have emotions. I control those emotions. I shut them down. They will not get me because what happens then is then they have power and control over you and you don't have power and control over them. Strong means you change the language. So like your friend says, yes, I do need help. And then you're able to get it. And then the cool thing about us strong people that are strong on the outside and the inside, when we know our weaknesses and we say we need help, is that we give permission to every person around us to do the same. Yes, absolutely. That's the key. And then the other key to me is change the language. Take the word help out of it. None of us want to say help. It's like, oh, right? (laughs) I need help. Oh, I would rather have you stab me than for me to say that. So, <laughs> well, you know, Amanda, and I mean, I, I, I agree, you know, because words mean things, right? Yeah. That's something that's, you know, as a young Marine officer that was beat into your head, especially when you go to all the schools, right? You know, to be very clear, to be able to articulate what it is you're trying to get across with the right words so that you're not confusing people, you know, because you don't want to be confusing people that have weapons and are going into battle, right? You want to, you want them to understand you know, what the objective is, what the intent is, uh, so that they can execute towards your intent. And, and that's the same thing. These words matter. And this so everyone knows, my friend Mark, he's he's good. Uh, I, as I was talking, I thought I, I should probably round that, that part out. Uh, he's He's been healthy and clear of cancer now for, for five years. And, you know, he goes back regularly and checks, but he had, he had a procedure and so he's he's doing well. And uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for my, my buddy. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so yeah. glad. I'm grateful you have them. Unity, that was, I talked about unity optimism, having buddies, having pals, yes. having people you can go to, having people who say, hey, you look off your game. And that's one of the things I'm going to circle back to is how do you change the word help? We all have different right. Language, right? And some people are very good with words. Some people are not. Some people are good with body language, reading it. Some people are not. So I encourage you with the people that are like your mark, your friend, that you have a code language with them. So with cadets, we, I did, I did a thing where 300 cadets asked to have lunch after I did the national symposium speech. And I was shocked. Holy smokes. I know. (laughs) Wow. And I was shocked. And I'm like, it's a year worth of lunch there. (laughs) Yeah. And they said, you know, they, they have some questions and they would like to have you know, a, a lunch with you. I'm like, oh, that's fabulous. Like what, like three or in there? Like, no ma'am, 300. I said, I don't know how to have lunch with 300. <laughs> it's okay. We got an amphitheater. We're bringing in box meals, but you don't get lunch. You get to stand in front of everybody. And I want, we want you to talk for 40 minutes and then do 20 minutes of Q and A. I'm like, okay, not a problem. Uh-huh. 
And I right. said, who's my audience other than cadets? And they said, it's the you know sexual assault response coordinators and it's the DE and I. And I said, few an easy crowd, easy questions. <laughs> And what I did is I love interaction. And so I say, okay, guys, if we're talking about offsetting depression and offsetting unworthiness statement and offsetting fear or doubt all the way down to being in the pit, I call this the adverse spiral and all the way down into the adverse spiral of um, thoughts of suicide and PTS. If you can't say I need help, you need to have other language. And so as a team, they came up with a code that they can use within their organization to say, we're in the clouds. I'm flying in the clouds meaning I'm lost, I'm disoriented, I don't know which way to go, my instruments aren't correct. Like, use a code language that makes sense to you. So some people it's, I don't feel like me. You know, firefighters might have a code, I don't know their language. Right. You know, uh, whatever an all alarm is, like you just say that. And my curriculum of purple threads, we tell each other purple, you know, PT, purple thread. So let me back that up. It's limiting personal thoughts, that are connected to past traumas that become physiologically tied in what you think, say, and do. Cognitive, communication, and behavioral. And those limiting personal thoughts and traumas, we go through what they are. And the more trauma you've been through, the harder it is to say, I need help. All right. And that's normal. And that's just normal. So we work, we start pulling apart those traumas and throwing them out and getting the resources. Um, and, and, and you, I mean, that's... Yeah, that, that's so smart. You know, what you just said, it's so true because those things, they're inside and most folks can't see inside you, right? <laughs> and so these things are battling for control of your thought, uh, for control of, you know, what you're willing and able to do. They put you back so that you're maybe depressed or, you know, you're ashamed, you know, and it, they're telling you that, you know, <laughs> it's like uh, you have to get past that. And this sounds like a great way to do it because you have to put sunlight on it. And then once you expose it, then you got to have a process for here's, here's how we handle that. And that's, that's amazing. That's, that's good to hear. <laughs> well, and it works because it's authentic and it's fun language. This doesn't have to be drama. We don't have to relive it. There's different therapy modalities I've been through and each one has helped. And I think the key, one of the key takeaways that I can give for people is be open-minded, be open-minded to different modalities. Um, when we're closed minded, they don't work. So I teach a monthly workshop to wounded warrior project and I come on stuff and they're like, oh, that crazy woo woo woman, you know, <laughs> and, and then they come back a month later and like, oh, it worked. That actually works. <laughs> There's some of these things that just work. And I don't know why I'm not smart, like a doctor, PhD, scientist, neuroscientist, but I read and, right. and then I keep an open mind and I try I'm like, oh, dang, that worked. That yeah. really worked. And so there's hope. You do not have to live in a state where you feel like you're crazy. You do not have to live in a state where you're triggered. You do not have to live in a state where you're in PTS. You do not have to live in a state where you're scared to send out your resume or take those next steps or think bigger. Like I tell people, think big, then think bigger. Like what you right. did in the military is phenomenal. It's fantastic. And now we're going to like make it even bigger. We're going to find the next mission. We're going to find, because when we think the best is behind us, that's depressing. When we yeah, think yeah. I'm going to take this and catapult it forward, that's inspiring. That is optimism. That is what we want. And we get stuck in this rumination of a mindset of negativity because PTS will do that. PTS will rewire your brain. So it will make you feel like you're crazy. Trauma will rewire your brain so that you do feel discouraged. So it's not like you're weak. It, it's like someone who's not eating. You're just not, you don't have the nutrients you need to go out and run a marathon. Right. right. So Absolutely. Let's eat some food and like, yeah. let's create new neural pathways to be positive and optimistic. Let's get the trauma out so that you can thrive. Yeah, I, that's, that's powerful. And I, I see this, you know, in folks who are, are transitioning, you know, some people are just, good at things they do you know others need a little more help or whatever uh and there are folks that transition smartly and everything works now it's not because they're just lucky i mean you know they're they have a hand in their destiny right and so they're good at it but then other people have challenges and there are a lot of different challenges to talk to and they're not weak people they're just having a different experience and i think some of the folks who transition well 
are kind of the folks that do the poo poo stuff on all the all, everything we're talking about because that's just not their experience. And you know whether it's a, a, a CEO of an organization that you know runs things very well in their own mind. Of course, I, I'm sure they do things good, right? But the people that aren't willing to listen to alternative uh, ways of achieving goals and making change because they become set in their ways. That that's frustrating, and you know, this is this part of our conversation. I think is so important because you talked about oh, the best years are behind me. A lot of folks that spend twenty or thirty years who give it all in the military, when they get out, if things don't go as smooth as they anticipated, you know, they're thinking, I've got a couple of degrees, I've been around the world, I've done this, that, and the other, but you know, on the employment side they're not finding the success that they knew was coming to them because of who they were, you know, they're not thinking about who they are and how to present that side of their personality and the optimism. And, you know, when you were saying that I was watching your facial expressions and I'm like, man, who could not think that this is great, you know, because you're upbeat, you're talking positively, you're talking about, you know, what's coming, you know, that you're part of this, that, you know, you've got a lot more to do. Let's get to it. You know, yeah. if you're rewired in that thinking, you're thinking backwards. You know, you're thinking that you, there's that regression that you go back to, you know, maybe I should have stayed in the military or, you know, boy, you know, life was so much better and, and I miss the things that I used to do. That's true. But guess what? You're not going back. So how do yeah. we move forward? Right. You know, these are important things that people who are transitioning, you know, absolutely need to hear. Because, again, it's not. It, it ain't easy, right? A lot of things can happen and you have to A, be aware that they can happen and that some of the stuff most likely will happen. So what's your plan? You know, yeah. how do you get, how do you go about it? And, and you know, yeah, please go ahead. And who, and who are you inspiring? So sometimes we need a good kick in the pants to get out that door, right? And yes. so for me, my son was the one who said, you know, I did everything for these kids. I, I, I took a vow at eight year old as an eight-year-old from my bedroom that the abuse would end with me, right? I didn't know what that really meant, but man, I knew about love, respect, and kindness because that was the opposite of what I grew up with and received. So that was what I was going to bring into this world as long as, as well, self-accountability and self-sufficiency for my kids. And so my big transition from dedicating for 25 years, my life, my heart, my soul, everything I did, I changed school district policy. I mean, I was in the schools. I ran a full-time company. I was at every single event and sport event that they had. I mean, I, I was gung ho a hundred percent, right? <laughs> like proud mom all the way. Amen. And then my son goes, mom, you're going to be an ugly empty nester. Like <laughs> you are... <laughs> You are so mission driven. If you don't have like, you know, like in front of the parade. Yeah. He's like, you cannot keep doing the same company you've done for 25 years. Like you are too mission driven for that. And he was the one who challenged me, who said, when we are gone, so my kids are Marines and my son is actually currently deployed right now. When we are, we're gone, you know, we're gone. There is no like coming over for dinner. There's no little birthday celebrations that you plan for like three weeks, you know, and decorate and all that stuff. And we're gone. Mm. And because of their jobs, my daughter was HMX one. So presidential helicopter squadron. Yes. Like, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I'm like super proud of her. Uh, Absolutely. So they can't communicate. They can't tell me where they're going. They can't tell me those types of things. And so she, he, that was, I'll be honest, it's four years later and I still struggle with that transition. I still want to go back, even though that was so hard and there are times I was going to scream or as my daughter would say, throat punch someone. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, Sorry. There was, that was her comeback line you know stand back or i'm going to throat punch you and i'm like okay okay <laughs> we don't do violence in our house right. and, um, so that's normal it's normal but i needed my son to say and now take this and teach people i never thought 300 cadets 300 of my kids would come forward and say we want to learn from you wow. so that's where i didn't admit and i i couldn't see that big Right. right. And neither can we when we're in doom and gloom and doubt and and unworthiness where where those purple threads love to live. But my life is so much bigger than I ever expected it was going to be because mm. one, I believe in mission. I believe in purpose. I am not here just to get a manicure. If you could see my nails, you would know why I say that they're horrendous. Um, <laughs> 
And, and I, I, I can't see, but I'll, you know. <laughs> take my word for it. They're, they're really yeah. bad. I should be talking like this. Um, <laughs> it's, to be, it's to make a change, to make sure that no other eight-year-old is standing in front of a mirror, to make sure, vowing that they're not going to have this, to make sure that people, so the classes and the workshops that I teach, that the adults come back and say, dang, I didn't know. I'm, I'm that person. I'm the one with limited beliefs. I'm the one who's a manipulator. I'm the one who's being an abuser. I didn't understand it till you changed the language and you helped me see me in it. So trust me, everyone, there is a much bigger mission waiting for you and be open to it. And if you don't mind me sharing a quick story, I loved it. What just happened to me in the last month Sure. to it and make it happen. Make it happen. My son made me start this company. I was only going to do it for 12 months. That was it. That was my gift back to the universe. And that was done. And I was going to go be laying on some beach doing my like easy <laughs> job, right? Not this right. hard stuff. Of course. Um, yeah. So find people who challenge you and don't be mad when they challenge you and then look for opportunities, make opportunities. So I'm at the post office and it's my son's 23rd birthday and I'm mailing off a package and in my wallet's open. And of course, I'm proud mom. I have my Marine photos of my kids and this lady standing behind me and like, we're supposed to be, you know, apart or whatever. And she's like, Oh, my son's in the military, this and that. And I said, well, congratulations. We had a little small talk. We had the mom like wink, wink, proud moment, you know, and right. I get in my car and I'm starting to drive away. She's like running across the parking lot. And I thought, okay, I start to lower my window and she's like, I just have a quick, quick question. And, and we started talking and her son is out her son. And of course I thought he was a Marine. So I'll do anything for anybody, but especially those Marines, right? Like right, Scott? I'll double down for Marines. That's and right. Said, My son was infantry and this and that. And um, I said, is he, and I was like, I'm sorry, I I'm late, but let me ask you a quick question. Is your son happy with his job? And she goes, yeah. And I look at my, and I'm like, is your son truly happy with his job? Because I hear all the time infantry, they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't have a skill set. I don't have, I don't want to work at Home Depot, right? Especially the right. infantry, like, oh. And so she's like, no. I said, thank you for being honest because you're honest. Here's my card. Have him contact me. Oh, nice. I can help. He contacted me. He's a father. He's a husband. He has a kind of a job that's a dead end job. He's been doing it for 11 years because he couldn't oh, see wow. beyond it. And, um, right. and I already have him introduced to four different people. And he, and then he said, okay, this is what he's looking for. This is what he wants. He just didn't know how to ask for help. So good old mom ran across a parking lot, looking like a crazy lady, like I do <laughs> saying, Hey, let's make an opportunity. God bless her. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm so glad you share that story in the, the back part of that too, because it absolutely lends so much credibility to who you are and who better to do what you're doing than you because of your life experience? You know, having a degree in a field, I mean, that's important too. But the life experience and to be that young, it's amazing that that was inside of you at that age to make that, to make that commitment. You know, I, sorry. Uh, Scott, wow. it's all good. Well, I, well, wasn't I, well, I would like to share something for just a moment. I don't usually sure. do this, but yeah, go ahead. I believe that Abigail is where she is because she acknowledged and was willing to accept help from others. And I think that is the foundation for healing. If you aren't willing to admit that you have a problem, then no one is available to help you because you don't have a problem. Wink, wink. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I really think that's why she's where she is. And I know something about her, but she knows a lot about me too. But yeah. that, that, that's the point of this. And I'll, I'll let it go with that. Well, yeah, Paul, I, I, you saved me twice from a technical standpoint and then from, you know, almost losing my lunch here, uh, starting to cry. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a soft guy nowadays, I guess, but uh, no. So uh, Abigail, what I was, you know, what I was trying to say is again, who, who better than you because of your experience. And I know we talked about this a little on the, on the phone Tuesday is you could have gone a whole nother route in life based on, you know, what you've been through uh, as a young daughter, you know, as a woman, but you chose 
to do all the things that you've just been talking about and you do them so well. And the fact that your son too, you know, that, that tells me a lot about him is what he saw in you as a mom. And he was so right because when you're engaged like you were, and you know, as well as me, that it ends in one day, right? Because when your child leaves, you know, hopefully they come back and see you, but life is very different from that. And then, so what do you do? That's transition, right? Are you prepared for that? Were you thinking about, well, you know, in another year, they're not going to be here. How does that affect me? What will I be doing? Because, you know, I'm not driving them here. I'm not going to this meeting. I'm not doing, you know, everything that you talked about that you were engaged in, that goes away. And then you can't be kind of stuck in this no man's land because you weren't yeah, you knew about it, but what did you do about it? And see, I, I I fell prey to that too with my youngest. My oldest left, went to college, and I still have my youngest, and I had four years with her, and it was great. But I didn't prepare myself for that empty nest, and so I was a, you know, I, I was I I'd never been depressed, but I went into a little bit of depression, and uh, somebody pointed it out to me, uh, the gal who had been cutting my hair for years, and it I mean it was, it seemed so obvious when she told me, but I didn't see it. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, you know, your son is, is a wise young man. Uh, of course, you know, he, he's got you for a mom. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think he far exceeds me. And he, we, we are very, very connected. Like I love and adore my family. We're super tight because of the obstacles that we have faced together and we're super tight. And he is my tough love. Like he, I'm tough love. He's tough love. My, my daughter is, I almost called her my sister. My daughter's tough <laughs> love. And he was one when I had more, and it's not like it's done. We have insecurities. And then when we can recognize them coming up, that's part of the curriculum I teach is recognizing in your body, recognizing in your thought, recognizing in your emotion, scanning when it's coming up. And I had limiting beliefs. I was like, Riley, it worked for you guys. He's like, mom, you just don't see yourself. Like all my friends come to you for advice. They don't, we don't do this at other people's homes. Like no one asks my friends, parents, <laughs> that's awesome. what do you think of this? And I'm like, isn't that normal? Like, that's the life I wanted. I wanted a house where oh. I felt I could go to the parent and, and get the best advice and get the best tools so I could think for myself and have the backup, but yet insight. And, and he was the one, Scott, who said, mom, your life lessons you learned in the trench of life. Like those things you taught us, purple threads and adverse spiral and these things that you made up so that we could understand what that meant like, you know, think, say, do is cognitive communication and behavioral. Well, no one's going to listen to cognitive tools, but they might right. think, you know, think, say, do they might. And, and yeah. one of the tools I want to give is um, a, a one I learned just from being a parent and trying to be the best parent that I could and research and read and try things out and ask for their honest feedback, right? Like, does that help? Does it not? It was a gratitude journal. And I actually called it the victory log. And so we wrote down in the victory log. And if you're transitioning, do this because I did, Scott, I transitioned for a year. I knew how hard it was going to be. My daughter was older and I knew that was hard. And I knew my son, we'd like finish each other's sentences. We have the same sense of humor. We hold the mirror up to each other authentically, mm -hmm. you know, and I knew it was going to be accountability hard. Partners, right? year. <laughs> I'm sorry. Accountability partners yeah, to a degree, right? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I spent a whole year being like, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this, because I won't celebrate birthdays with him. And it didn't really help. <laughs> 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 I still right now then have to go sit in his bedroom and just cry and then be like, Aww. okay. And that's the thing too. It's okay. Yes. It's okay yeah. to cry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to miss your service. It's okay to miss the camaraderie. It's, it means you have emotions and emotions are beautiful. Those are our fuel for action. But we have to harness them and know how to use those emotions in a good way. So when I get scared, I remember my son sitting in the corner of my office telling this. So I get up on that stage because if I helped him and I helped the trajectory change of my daughter and him and his friends, which I know I did, I might be able to give just a, a glimmer of hope or fertilize the seeds that were planted and right. help other people on their path. So it's not about me. And that's where the servant comes in. It's not about me when I do coaching and stand up on the stage and, you know, and tell the story and share. It's about serving other people and helping, giving any insight so they can shorten that learning curve. My learning curve was stupid long and I can call it stupid because if <laughs> I had known half of what I know now, I could have done so many other things, but yet I wouldn't be here without going through all this. 
So my right. hope is that anything I can share and gleam and other people give and share, um, the better we all come and the faster the unity and the optimism and we all become thrivers. And that is my yes. goal. Yes. You know, Abigail, I, you know, this is an incredible story, you know, and as a dad, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, you or, you know, my daughters at that age, and it, it breaks your heart to, you know, to think that someone that young would have to be, you know, going through that and that you, you told yourself that this is, you know, it ends here and look at you now. That's the amazing part. Look, look at what you've done. That's the part that the other end of me getting emotional is it's so good to see. It, it really is because not everybody, you know, winds up uh, becoming who you are and you're so strong and you're giving back. You could have chose to do your talented person. You could have done a lot of anything else, but this was so compelling for you life story wise that you're turning around and you're throwing that rope and you're lending that hand and you're a cheerful warrior, you know, uh, you yeah. bring the light and that's, that's awesome. Uh, you know, something else you share with me when we were talking about the, the kids uh, share with me or share with folks uh, what you told me about roots and wings. Cause I, I thought that was very, very compelling that, that, that resonated. If you oh, recall good. in your, in your email, if you can, um exactly I pull it up i don't remember sometimes i say things i'm oh. like oh dang that actually sounds good i should write that down <laughs> well uh, so, yeah well here, thank let me, you let me, thank you for yeah, saying all that scott and i have a long way still to go i still have fears and doubts and but i know when i i can recognize when i feel them i know what my thought patterns are i know what my limiting beliefs were and that they can sneak in and so i make sure i take care of myself i do what i call the foundational eight I make sure I get enough sleep, which is eight hours a night, right? I make sure I drink enough water, which is eight cups a day. I make sure that I get my exercise, right? I make sure that I have good, good long friendships and I make sure that I don't overwhelm myself. Um, right. And so I think, thank you, but I want it to, it's a process. So we never are like there, right? And and so yes. gentle to yourself, That's important. kind yeah. to yourself. And, and know that there's going to be problems and struggles and defeats and setbacks. And that's only, that's accept, expected, right? right. And so the roots and the wings things. When I was pregnant, I painted in my daughter's nursery, a, a mural that was over her crib, like a whole wall is a corner. And there was a sun and there were flowers. And I put like um, a big flying bird. So my logo is an eagle. I've always been attracted to eagles for many reasons. And I put on the wall, I was pregnant. She wasn't even born yet. Roots and wings oh. because I knew even before I had a child that I wanted to give my children these strong, powerful wings, that they were confident, they were protectors and providers of their own. And yet they always had roots. They always knew they could come back and that the last one still can get me teary eyed. And what was it? Did you pull up by any chance? For yeah, I, I, I sure did. Yeah. Thank you uh, for coming back to that. So uh, just the context of uh, this part of the email I was sharing um, with Abigail that my youngest was going back to school and we were going through a bunch of stuff to get her ready to do that. And, um, and so that was yesterday. I, you know, drove her down and put her on an airplane. She flew back up to school, but uh, I, and I told her, I said, yeah, it's going to be kind of a bittersweet day. And this is what uh, Abigail wrote. She said, good luck with the bittersweet day. Roots are easy to give your kids and wings are quite another matter. Wow. That really, I was like, that is so true as a parent. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that helped. I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And I get teary eyed because it's so true. And yet yes. we know we want them to have wings. Right. And, and yet um, it, it's just so hard. And when you see it in other parents and that's where you can, yeah. you can find commonalities and you can reach out and tell people, cause I went through the same thing. I'm like, I'm like, what is wrong with me? And then COVID hit. So we're even more, oh, wow. I, I yeah. live on some acreage. And so like you're isolated, you're physically isolated, yep. you 
there. My yeah, son is here. delightful. <laughs> yeah, he has a delightful laugh. And just hearing all those sounds, I knew I at some point were annoying when you're trying to work, you know. And then, <laughs> but like the laughing and the running and the arguing and the chair dropping and the like, come on, come on, come on, can we go now? Can we go? Now? Can we go now? Are we going to go now? Yeah. Let's go outside. Come on, yep. come look at the sunset. You know. Um, oh. And. And it's, it's the, the feelings are real. So honor the, whatever feeling you're having in your transition, honor it. It's okay. Yeah. Like That's, tell yourself it's okay. I'm not a mess. I'm not falling apart. I'm not crazy. I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb. I'm not weak. This is part of the human experience. And yes. Yeah. And, and not enough people are saying what you just said. Uh, it, it's, it is, it, it's okay to be human, right? Uh, yeah. uh, even though you're a mediator, guess what? Uh, you're not going to be eating as much meat as you used to. You're you're coming back into society, and uh, you know, as a transitioning person uh, from the military, and it, it's okay uh, to understand that you're going to have these feelings. And then, you know, how do you how do you go about uh, addressing those things and moving forward? Uh, you know, this is we're we're like right at an hour. Uh, this has been fantastic. I. I wasn't expecting to get, uh, you know, a little, you know, watery here, but, but it's all good. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm man enough to say I cry and, and I do, and it's cool. <laughs> do you know, actually but, tears are adrenaline. It's the body's quickest way of getting adrenaline for fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. The, when an amygdala kicks in and right. you know, it's, it's the quickest way. So sometimes I'm wow, like, I, I didn't know why don't I, yeah, why don't I just cry? And then I do this when I'm running, I'm a trail runner and I, you're breathing deeply and they say grief lives in your lungs. And so you breathe. I like to run at a fast cadence. Like I have to get my heart, like heart rate up. I have to, it has to be an effort. It can't be like a walk around my neighborhood. Um, and when the tears start building, I, if no one's around, <laughs> right. sure, of course, I just yeah. let them like thing. And then I like, wait, <sighs> Okay, I guess that's over. Like, and then I go on and I like run even faster. Like, so instead of like trying to fight it and judge myself and I'm weak and I'm bad and like, wow, Scott, I thought you were a man. Why are you crying up? It makes me actually like you more. It makes me trust you more for me to be vulnerable with you because right. you allowed feelings. You're going to allow me to have feelings. So then I feel closer with you and safer with you. So it's a, yeah. So thank you for sharing it. Well, yeah, I, you know, I feel like I've turned, I feel like the tables were turned and you're, you're like, you're, <laughs> hey, let me, let me do, let me share one thing. I think I've mentioned this once before in, uh, in a previous podcast and it, it and is, uh, it is about crying and it's about manly men, right? Go back to the founding of our nation. Go back to the very, very end of that time in war and the uh, Continental Congress had not paid all the, you know, and there were women that were fighting too, right? That's not always talked about, but they had not paid the soldiers. You know, there was issues with money. And so they're getting close to turning the tide and winning the war. But there were some officers that were skeptical and they wanted to be paid. And okay, and I get that, right? I mean, they're fighting this incredible war uh, uh, for free. So there was a plan, there was a mutiny planned, and George Washington, because he had a spy ring, he found out about it. So he called a meeting the day that they were to go march on the Continental Congress and demand their money. And so, again, he had a meeting, and so he did that because they knew, oh, crap, <laughs> if we're not at this meeting, someone, they're going to know that something's up. And so it foiled the plot. So they're all at this meeting and George Washington had gotten spectacles. You know, he had never had them before. And so he's addressing the men about all of the things we've gone through. We're almost there. Let's stay the course. This means so much to all of us. And he had a letter that he wanted to read and he purposely pulls out the letter and then takes out his glasses and puts them on and then looks back up and said, I too have grown old in the service to our country that I, I need these to be. It wasn't a dry eye in that group and that, that 
put an end to, you know, what could have been a really bad situation, then we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? But all that to say is, yes, men can have emotions. You can feel, you know, okay to cry because it's what, you know, it's, it's a human thing. And if George Washington and those other men who spent, you know, years on the battlefield, if, if they can have a teary eyed, it's okay. You know, yeah. it absolutely is okay. So yeah. I love I that love, story, by the way. <laughs> I love that story. So we, so I've taken my kids to Mount Vernon before and um, we call him George. We're really close with him. <laughs> yeah. So we, he's my favorite, by the way. <laughs> George is one of our all time favorites and of what a man does because my husband walked out when he got caught with all the gambling problems that he had and he was hiding in the money, taking all the money and all that kind of mm. yeah, yeah, yeah stuff. Yeah. Um, my kids didn't weren't raised with a dad. I did my best, right? And but I'm not a dad. You know, I taught my son to play baseball, but it turns out as a female, I grew up playing softball. So I taught him a softball swing, not a baseball chop. <laughs> right. You know what? He still was on the championship team, you know, like, but it's okay. Yeah. But they wanted a man. So I researched really strong men, and good old George was one of them. Like good old George was the guy that was a stand-up guy, stand-up stepdad, stand-up husband, stand-up, you know, in so many different ways and for our country and what he did and didn't want to become president and didn't want to be called king and and the humility and everything. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember that story, Scott, and it's, yeah, if we can look to each other for that inspiration and feeling and emotion and camaraderie, it's a beautiful thing to have that connects us versus separates us. And the key difference is judgment. We can't have judgment stand away. Amen. Wow, that's powerful. (laughs) Quick, write that down. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Well, this is being recorded, so I can get. (laughs) Okay. Wow, that 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 is well. You know, uh, we're we're at uh, about eight after the hour, and and I feel like we can you know keep going, but uh, just for the sake of the audience, and certainly you know to be a a better shepherd of your time, I'm sure you have other things happening today. Uh, I. I want to thank you so much, first of all, for who you are as a person, secondly, for what you do with who you are, for coming on today and sharing you know, your story and, and the goodness that you bring. Uh, people need that today, and uh, I'm happy that uh, you're doing this because you're helping folks. You absolutely are, and, and that's one thing that I love about you know, my time post service is, you know, I feel the value of helping others. And it's important, because we all struggle. And if you've been through struggles, as I said earlier, who better than you to do what you're doing. And once we realize that, and and give that gift, it comes back full circle, you know, the, the, the feeling of helping others, the goodness that, you know, wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, you help, but you enabled this person to move on to that next level into a, a good place in life. And that's what we're all here for. You know, we're here to help each other. That's what we should be doing. Yeah. And it's nice I, to see folks that that get it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. And I encourage people, you don't have to know the end game and it doesn't even have to make sense. Like what I set out to do didn't even make sense. I was like, how am I going to make money? I'm like, I don't worry about it. Like I do worry about it. I'm self, you know, self-employed and I squirreled some money away. And I, that's why I gave it 12 months. I was going to do it for 12 months. And when you give without asking for return, you give because you care about others and it's authentic. It's amazing how many other people can see that and trust it. And it resonates with them. Um, and I never thought that I would, I really did think my company's create awareness, change lives. I knew I was going to create some form of awareness, but I wasn't ready for Scott for how many times people said, not only did this change my life, but how many people came to me and said, you saved my life. This saved wow. my life. Today was going to wow. be my life. And that was, talk about a mission, man. That mission is way bigger. I wanted people to be kind to each other. Stop hitting each other. Stop hurting each other. Stop being judgmental. I didn't think I was going to save lives. Like this right. took its own trajectory and mission much bigger than I thought. So anybody out there who's transitioning and you're like, but my idea is little, it's stupid, it's small. First, stop the negative thinking and the judgment on it. <laughs> And ask, am I passionate about this? Would I do this if I wasn't getting paid, right? Like the money, will, it'll figure it out. Because um, money is important. It's stressful not to have money. But right. do that. And if you're authentic in it, it could, it could leap into this whole different thing 
that has a much bigger mission than maybe what you've even done ever in the past in your previous job that you're afraid to let go of. Holy smokes. <laughs> That's, that is so true. I mean, it, it, it really is. This is, this is gold. I mean, we're, 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 we hit that vein of gold <laughs> as we're, you know, drilling into these things. That's, uh, that's incredible. And uh, Abigail, uh, are, are you able to answer a few questions or comments yeah. if uh, there are folks that, uh, that are still here and, and want to do that? Yeah, of course. I would okay. be happy to. I would love to. And Okay. Um, Let me check real quick. Uh, yeah. So it looks, oh, hey, Sarah's still here. How about that? Oh, here. Yes. Yeah. See, this was just too good to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I still have, uh, you know, 10 more minutes. So oh, I have okay. 15 more minutes. Well, well, Sarah, since you're here, let, let, let's, if you don't mind, let's do what we traditionally do at this point. Uh, if I can hand it over to you uh, and, and you work your magic here, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. First off, I, I just want to acknowledge something with you, Scott, um, you know, retired Lieutenant Colonel and you get Terry, you have one of the biggest hearts. And I, I am, I, I am so grateful to be able to be on this platform with somebody like you and with the people. Cause I think that is the commonality is that we, um, we are all passionate on this call to to protect our protectors and i and i i have to say now i feel like we're we're talking to the queen abigail <laughs> i i am so proud of you i have been teary this whole call i have been absolutely teary this whole call and i didn't have to talk like scott so i was a little protected here but i think and i i, I think just to be potent because i want to let everybody else uh, just to try to nail down what i want to uh, share of what i appreciate about you Abigail uh, is um, you, they're tears of joy, actually. They're tears of joy because the people who deserve to be free have the life experience, the suffering that you've had to go through to figure out how to navigate that, that clarity to freedom, that the truth to freedom, what that looks like, what is the language that frees people versus making people feel condemned, you know, which I know people like me, I am like really trying to always learn better language so that I can also be a source of freedom to others. So I recognize that in you, I recognize that strength and that absolute steadfast passion to free other people, especially our protectors. And so I, I'm going to start crying again, but I just I honor you, Abigail. You are a soul sister, uh, but somebody I aim to be when I grow up. So I just thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Another amazing way to end actually this uh, this uh, season. So Boy, I, I couldn't have said that any better. Uh, amen. <laughs> and thank you for the kind words too. Uh, that it means a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I think you just wanted to see me cry again as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm we kidding, will all be but... crying on this call. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, well, I, I and thank you. I second cool. that about you, Scott. Absolutely amazing. I see your posts on LinkedIn, and that's the reason too why you know I want to connect. And it's important to align with like-minded people, but it's also important to be able to listen to people that you don't agree with and you don't have commonality with. Because I tell right. you, when I do my purple threads work. Everybody in the room will be silent because they'll say, who in the room felt like that? Because we share limiting thoughts, but we do it in a way that no one knows who's saying what. And it immediately builds connection, immediately tears down walls of resentment. And we learn and grow. And Sarah, I feel that about you. I learn and grow from you. So if we can just keep the momentum and going, and I love your freedom versus feeling condemned. I wrote that down. That is... <laughs> that freedom is everything and personal freedom and, and protecting it in each other. Um, so I would encourage everybody to find someone like a Scott and a Sarah that you can go to and authentically share what you're feeling, what you're experiencing um, as a sounding board accountability partner, as Scott said. And um, I have other resources, so feel free. I do truly authentically care. So feel free to reach out to me anytime. And just thank you both, Sarah and Scott, for this opportunity and everyone who is on right now and who might listen in the future. Thank you. Amen. Uh, thank you. And uh, 
you know, you talk about writing things down. Sarah is very good at, at doing that too. You know, you know, when we have these interviews, she's taking notes. So at this portion of the show, you know, she'll do what she just did. She'll share her heart, uh, you know, through her notes. Uh, and then she uh, turns it over uh, and lets other folks, you know, say what they have to say too, but she, she just does that so well. And uh, I mean, that, that, I think that's kind of what makes, that, that's like the icing on the cake, right? The, and it comes because it comes at the end. And what's the best thing about the cake? It's the icing, right? <laughs> but, okay, Sarah, uh, I'm going to stop bragging on here and, and, and again, get it back to you to <laughs> see if we got uh, folks that have comments and questions. Oh, Scott, thank you so much. Um, does anybody have anything to share? I see Paul unmuted himself. I do. And I... I want to say this carefully, but I also want to be clear. I treasure each of the people on this call. I, I truly do. Because I've learned something from everybody. I've had the opportunity to share things from time to time. And I have to tell you that, and I don't hesitate to say this for a minute. Abigail has been an absolute treasure to me over the time we've known each other. And I'm not going to go into any of the details. I'm just going to tell you that that's how I feel and why I feel the way I do. But each of you are important to me. And, and all for different reasons. But the reasons don't matter. What matters is what is. And I will share one brief story that was prompted by a comment that Scott made, and he may have seen this at some time living up where he does. And that is, I was sitting out on my patio one afternoon, just reading my Kindle and looking off into space and enjoying the view and the clear day. And here is a hawk flying around in a circle and gaining altitude. But what was unique about that is that it had a baby hawk attached to its tail feathers by biting them. Took it up to what I think was about 5,800 feet. And I've been a pilot, so I kind of have some understanding of altitude. And then when it got up high enough, it literally shook the baby off. And that was how they teach to fly. And I had never seen that before. <laughs> but when, when Scott made the mention of something that you said about the power of the wings, um, that's as close to nature as I can get with it. <laughs> I just thought I'd share that for whatever it's worth. Oh. And Poor Michelle has not had a chance to talk and neither has Dan, so I'm going to be quiet and hear their wisdom. Thank you. Oh, that was beautiful. Paul, oh, thank you. Uh, Michelle, you got your hand up. Um, so first of all, on a, a little kind of side note, um, Scott, I want to thank you. I still, I feel like I'm a little bit on the newer side and I haven't been able to join in on, obviously I've missed quite a few episodes if we're on 42 or something you said, <laughs> but when I first saw you, my dad is a retired California Highway Patrol and you remind me of so much like him, just very, <laughs> um, you like just the manner that you hold yourself. And that is a huge, huge compliment, by the way. Oh, but, well, well, that, well, Taken that way, because uh, boy, those 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 folks do a tremendous service to uh, to people like us. Uh, amen to that. Thank you. That's Absolutely. a huge compliment. <laughs> well, and I mean it as a compliment. And so when you had the opportunity to show the emotion today, the level of vulnerability that comes through on these meetings is what has kept me coming back. And it, it really does, like Abigail says, it really does build like a level of trust. Like, I feel like it brings you in that next circle. You have your circle of trust. And every time you share something vulnerable, you get closer and closer. And I just, I wanted to say how much I appreciate that because this group has truly been very life-changing for me. So, and Sarah, I've got, 
man, I could go on probably <laughs> 10 years straight with how much I appreciate you. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to say that as a side note, um, I uh, mentioned something to Abigail. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. <laughs> Wow. Well, no, thank you. And uh, that's, that, that means a lot. Uh, it, it really does. And it's nice to know that when you're, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, you, you don't put yourself out there to necessarily, you know, have these emotions. Sometimes they come and, you know, and, and that's what they are. But uh, it is good to, to know that uh, at least efforts to, you know, try to bring things to people's awareness and to want to put yourself out there to help that it, you know, that it resonates with others. And, and we always say, hey, if it's just one person, that's yeah. fine. Because yeah. then that one person goes and does their thing. And then there's another one person, another one person, right? That there's there's goodness to that. And, and that matters. And thank you, Michelle, for stepping up within the organization here, you know, working right. now uh, to kind of help bring us together uh, in a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that folks aren't going to necessarily know or see, but it'll make our job better you know we'll we'll be getting our stuff out to more people and it's going to be well organized and same with with paul's you know professional uh, ability to help bring this together and so yeah good to have you on board <laughs> thank you <laughs> well thank you and abigail okay. i really appreciated your everything you said today um i am not on the military side um i'm actually a law enforcement dispatcher and i have been for um just over well, actually in nine days, it'll be 16 years. So, um, but since uh, January of 2021, I've actually been on workers' comp leave for post-traumatic stress. So when you were talking about the post-traumatic stress and changing the language, one thing I've learned from this group from our Thursday night meetings is what Sarah says, post-traumatic stress injury, because it means I'm not condemned. It means that there's still hope for me. And I'm being into like a forced transition from out of law enforcement into the civilian world, which has been bringing us many, many challenges. But the other thing that you said about the post-traumatic stress, I almost feel like there's different stages because you're right. Back when I was in deeper trenches, I didn't want to hear post-traumatic stress growth or anything about growth because it was so dark and desolate and no hope. But even now that I'm still going through it, I still have my triggers. I still have symptoms of it. I still do all my therapies and everything. And I come on this group. I love that you say post-traumatic growth because now I actually feel like even though I'm still dealing with it, I feel like I've reached that growth part. So I think people don't realize there can potentially be different levels of post-traumatic stress. So I, I appreciate you saying that. I, that is oh, an ec excellent point, Michelle. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, that is an excellent point, Michelle. And um, I recently went through some stuff where I was getting triggered and because it wasn't as bad as it was before, then what I did was um, I didn't think it was PTS. And so there's an organization called 220 that, um, yeah. And so I went through their protocols and she was like, she was amazing, um, Dr. Pamela Arnell. And it was amazing. I was like, ah, oh, dang it. Because I didn't realize that was still PTS because it wasn't anything as bad as this before, but she's like, right. is it normal? Like, is this, is that, will you consider this your, you know? And so thank you for pointing out that there's different phases and stages of it and to keep going. That's my, my hope on this is keep trying different modalities because what works for you or what might not work for you might work for other people. So right. just know there's hope, there's optimism. There's all these wonderful organizations out there who are addressing this and have different modalities. So find what resonates with you because you can absolutely overcome it. Yeah, the power of our story has definitely linked me with so many different things. And I've reached a point where I'm like, I'm gonna try it all. <laughs> like, I will take bits and pieces from everything, but you're right, because it's not a one shoe fits all. And it, it's interesting how you said too, that when you're experiencing the, the symptoms, you didn't realize it was post-traumatic stress. You didn't realize it was linked to it. Because how often do we see people minimalize their traumas. Oh, well, I went through that, but it's not as bad as so-and-so, so it's okay. 
So I think it's interesting that we even kind of still have that mindset to minimalize, but I'm glad you went through 22-0. I got to experience some of that stuff with Daniel also. <laughs> wow. Well, Michelle, thank you uh, for that. And hey, if we if we could, guys, it uh, it looks like Sarah had to go, and you know she uh, said goodbye in the in the text. But it looks like Daniel uh, has some things that uh, he might want to say. Daniel, uh, what you got? Uh, absolutely, I don't want to be the only one to not to share. So uh, I want to say thanks. <laughs> yeah, come on, man. <laughs> thanks to uh, to Abigail for sharing and for connecting with me on LinkedIn, uh, but also talking about you know our our roles changing as parents, especially as fathers. I was just talking with that about that with my lovely wife Melissa last night, uh, because I guess our youngest graduated high, uh, college in May, and it's starting to affect me a little more now because I think it's that final stage. Well, when he was still in school, it's like okay, we're still supporting, you know, we're still connected because we're still paying for that tuition. Um, but now that he's graduated, I'm I started to realize that, yeah. What do I do now? And you know, I was talking to uh, somebody else about it, and started to get a little teary-eyed. And I'm like, "What the heck's going on here?" <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's just uh, changing our roles uh, is a way to look at it, or transition. You know, and, and now we're, we're we still support. Um, you know, all of our kids, uh, but of course, the favorite is the one that still lives in Arizona, um, and the one with the grandbabies. <laughs> Uh, yeah, those grandbabies are, are nice, I'm sure. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to that at, at some point, right, uh, when it's the right time. But, uh, right. hey, Daniel, if, if I may, man, uh, reach out to me. Uh, I've, you know, I've been doing this. Uh, both my daughters are out of college. My oldest, uh, she finished her master's two years ago, and she, and it, process-wise, it just takes a while to get into the job that she's into now and she just got the job and she is so excited i am over the moon proud of both my daughters but uh just real quick last night i had dinner with both of, of them uh my oldest came down because she was in san diego onboarding for a new job and so she met us uh for for dinner so it was me both my daughters and then my youngest daughter who was leaving to go back to grad school one of her friends from undergrad met us down there too. So it was me and three young ladies and having a, an adult conversation with these gals that aren't kids anymore. I mean, they are, I mean, they're women, they're smart, they've got plans. And it's like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm humbled that I had a part in that, you know, but man, they've, they're doing their thing. And it's so cool to watch. And it's tough too, because, you know, as a parent, you know, the, the what you were getting to. Um, so I, I've got a lot of that going on. So if you ever want to chat about that, let's, let's do that. You know, uh, absolutely. in fact, next time I'm, if I'm in Arizona, I'm absolutely going to be looking you up. Uh, cause I, I want to sit down and, you know, drink some of that good coffee with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, maybe my lovely wife and I will, uh, will come to San Diego area. Hey, and if you guys do, we, we absolutely have to meet up, uh, you know, because there's a bunch of us here in, in San Diego, uh, or, you know, if you're, you know, coming through Temecula too, there's wine, you know, this is, there's wineries everywhere, there's breweries, you know, <laughs> I'll, we'll show you a good time out here. <laughs> absolutely. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so that's definitely a tough transition there for me, you yeah. know, as that protector dad, and, you know, trying to let go of that a little bit. Um, but de definitely appreciate everything that uh, Abigail shared. And, yes. Uh, and, and truly appreciate everybody on, on this call and in the power of our story tribe. Amen to that. Yeah, it's hard to let go sometimes. <laughs> Scott, do you know um, Michelle or Abigail? Do you know her? Know anything about her? I'm sorry, Michelle Franklin or what? Yes. Which Michelle? Michelle Franklin. No, I've never met Michelle before today. Daniel and I were both police officers. She is a dispatcher. And I can sit here and tell you without any reservation whatsoever that she has been slammed harder than any cop I know on the street. And I really mean that. And she is very precious. She huh. is coming through that and she is 
walking away from it. And, and you have to admire people who, like you, Abigail, who just say, yes, I need help. And help might not be the right word, but that's the message. And I define success as any movement in the direction of a worthwhile goal. So when you think that you're not worth anything, any of you, including me, am I making progress? And if so, is it because of something somebody else did or is it because of something I did? And I think those are important things to recognize when you talk about the languaging of uh, growth. Uh, which is incredibly important. It's an incredibly powerful concept as it relates to, to uh, traumatic stress. And, and so any growth is a movement in the direction of your worthwhile goals. And, and I'm sure Daniel has his own message about that. Um, he's as wise as any of the rest of us. So. <laughs> Yeah, you are, Daniel. Don't shake your head. No. <laughs> you see, yeah, that's he, that's self-defeating talk. <laughs> no, he's he's a humble man. <laughs> yes, he is. All right. Well, guys, uh, this has been a fantastic way to close out uh, season number one here. Uh, it is incredibly hard to believe it's been a year. It's been a year almost to the day now that uh, I was actively working uh, with Sarah. Uh, under her umbrella of the power of our story and creating uh, this part of that umbrella, you know, the what's next beyond service. This has been so meaningful this year has changed my life in, in many ways. Uh, and I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for the people that have spent time uh, wanting to share their stories through interviews because so much comes out of these and the people like everyone here that has joined us today uh, that you know do so habitually and the folks that come when they can that's that's so incredible that folks uh, like what we're doing here and that it means something to them and then for the folks that contact me that uh, you know aren't here listening in real time but then they go and and hear it and watch it you know when they have time and come back and they comment about uh, the good stuff that this group of people are doing and that is so and it's empowering it's affirming it's uplifting and it uh like with uh, abigail it just reaffirms that all of what you've done matters because you're focusing those things forward into a good you know uh a good path for people uh, and so this has been fantastic. I thank you guys again for your time and, and getting kind of closing things out here, getting back to you, Abigail. Thank you uh, again for who you are, for what you do. And, and I, I'm, my hope is that more folks from uh, today's talk are, are going to be, you know, looking to you for uh, what you do. And that's going to, you know, come full circle back to you. Uh, so that's a good thing. And thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Scott. And for what everyone here has done and what you continue to do, I'm excited for your season two. Um, I think you'll put in any of your show notes ways for people to contact me there. I have other speeches on YouTube on my channel. I have all of 28 subscribers. Woo! So help me like <laughs> up my numbers, yes. like them, um, subscribe. Um, but there's some short speeches on there that if any of this had content and you want to know more about purple threads, um, there are some talks out there about it, but people can always reach out to me because I really do authentically care. And I am a big supporter of this work that you're doing, Scott, of Sarah's work. Um, Paul has been an amazing human being that is like this, <laughs> you know, bright light in the world that reminds us that that's all around us. I know that it's easy to gravitate towards all the negativity we hear, but I refuse to look at that. Um, that's okay, but I'm going to move on because this is where we're going. And, yeah. um, and so you have a tribe of that and I'm honored to be now hopefully included in it. So thank no, you. you, you absolutely are. And, and Paul's the gentle sage, right? He's, <laughs> he really is. 
So, hey, uh, what you just I'd said. I asked to get that in writing, you know, so I could give it to my <laughs> wife. <laughs> well, now she can actually see it and hear it because uh, it's recorded. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, Abigail, yeah, we will absolutely put those links on the under the description part of this interview once it posts to YouTube so that folks will, you know, be able to do that. And, you know, so if you can just, uh, send that to me and Sarah in a DM on LinkedIn, and then we'll just pull from there and uh, she'll make sure it goes into the video once it uh, posts. And then I'll, you know, I'll do a, a compilation maybe, or one segment of about two to four minute video that I'll post on LinkedIn that will direct folks to the full interview. So, so that's how we'll do that and uh, all good stuff. So, you guys, uh, it's the 4th of July coming up here, uh, you know, this this 4th of July weekend. Uh, thank God for this country, the folks that serve, the people that help, people that serve. Uh, and we got to be thankful for what we have. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And I know you guys know what I'm talking about. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother show, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to season two. Uh, and, and I hope and pray that you guys will be part of that too. So with that, uh, I'm going to end the show. Uh, God bless you guys. And again, have a great 4th of July weekend.